The countdown is on. Everything you need to get the edge at the end of the market day. This is The Close. Sorry, Charlie and the rest of the Bratosphere, but Wall Street's telling you that this is a small cap summer. Live from Studio 2 here at Bloomberg headquarters in New York, I'm Romaine Bostic. And I'm Alex Steele. This felt like a m- monumental week. Yeah, absolutely. To be sure. Yeah, and you know what? Mm. Could get even mo- more monumental next week. It, oh, yeah. so true. We get about 40% of the S&P reporting next week and four of the MAG7. So I appreciate the S&P is up by 1% today. Uh, but for the uh, overall for the week, we're down now two straight weeks for the S&P. And you have to wonder... Who's going to want to have a lot of risk on into this weekend and next week's earnings? Some of the big movers of the week, though, the 210 spread has moved 16 basis points just this week as steeper as we go. That's a pretty solid move. Also, dollar yen here, that was causing a lot of consternation, very close to that 200-day moving average and crude getting hit just really over the last hour or so now, down over 2%, Romaine. I I really wonder... Is that rotation over yet? Well, the week's long rotation into some of those economically sensitive shares, at least for today, does continue on here. And I have seen some significant staying power there as more and more data that would justify a Fed cut continues to mount. Traders pushing deeper into those lagging corners of the bull market this Friday. That includes health care, industrials and utilities. A 13th day of outperformance for the Russell in the past 15 sessions. The longest stretch of small cap outperformance all year long. Now, the latest push today came on the heels of this morning's PCE report, which showed another month of core inflation prints roughly in line with the Fed's average target. That same report, though, did show that while personal spending is growing, it's doing so at a slower pace and income growth is actually easing even more rapidly. And another developing story to keep an eye on today is the U.S. government's lawsuit against famed short seller Andrew Left and Citroen Capital. This is part of a now three-year-long probe into the relationships between hedge funds and short sellers, a probe that threatens to ensnare other money managers and activist investors as well. But we circle back to the top of the show and the big theme of the day and really the entire summer, Alex, and that is the continued outperformance of small caps. Yeah, so here's a really fun one. So if you take a look at the IWM, which is basically the Russell 2000 uh, ETF, and then the triple Qs, uh, which is uh, the uh, tech ETF, this is really the rotation we're talking about. So the white line is small caps, and then the blue line is tech, and it's just a chart for the last 30 days. Not a big deal, but man, you see this right here, sort of right after we got that CPI read, uh, and you have a big shift within the market. Tech moving lower, and uh, the small caps moving higher. In fact, now you have small caps up, or the IWM, for about three straight weeks. We're now at the highest level since November of 2021. And if the consensus is being de-risked right now, do we have more of that consensus to kind of ring out of the tech market? That will be the big question of the day here. Our stock sitting on some pretty decent gains on the day, though, when we talk about that rotation and the yin-yang between small and big caps continuing for a fourth straight week. Joanne Feeney joining us right now on this Friday afternoon to kick us off to the close, partner and portfolio manager at Advisors Capital Management. Let's talk about that rotation, Joanne, and more importantly, talk about what's giving investors the confidence to rotate into some of those economically sensitive sectors. When you look at the data, do you have that same confidence? Well, hey, Romain, Alex, good to see you guys both. Uh, you know, clearly investors are encouraged by the macro data that's remained so resilient all year long, including the consumer of being strong. And now with greater belief that interest rates are going to be cut uh, here in the latter part of the year, more than just tech is helped by lower interest rates. And that's what we're starting to see. We're seeing it in company reports. We're seeing it in their guidance. Look at biotech, look at pharma, look at industrials, right? We're starting to see that improved outlook start to play out. And and really, it's been a story of earnings and guidance uh, this year more than anything else. Give me, balance that out, though, with some of the concerns that have been raised about the health of the consumer, particularly when it comes to the more anecdotal stuff that we're getting out of these conference calls. I know it hasn't quite shown up in the data, but everybody seems to be on edge here that at least some sort of portion of the consumer right now is tapped out. No, that's absolutely right. And that's where picking and choosing is so very important. The aggregate data continue to show strength in consumer spending, but uh, the aggregate data hides a lot of weaknesses. And the weaknesses we're seeing are at the low end and even up to the middle where those higher prices over the last few years are really squeezing uh, the consumer budgets. So we're seeing them shift towards cheaper alternatives, which is why we have liked TJ Maxx for so long. Um, But we're seeing also some pain at the high end, even among the very wealthy, because those luxury brands, it turns out they didn't quite 
they didn't quite set their prices appropriately for the wider market that they play in. And so we're starting to see some adjustments there. So yeah, while the aggregate uh, data look pretty good, we're clearly seeing some cracks at the low end. We're seeing it in delinquency rates rising in the credit card data. And that is a warning sign. So you really have to pick and choose where to be in consumer, whether it's an off price like TJ Maxx, whether it's something else in consumer that people can't do without. Like for example, a new home for those in their 30s that are trying to move out of their parents' basements or they're having kids. And so that's another reason why we like Lennar. It's it's sort of inelastic demand. Folks need a place to live mm -hmm. and they specialize in first time home buyers and one step up. So there are places to look in consumer that remain strong. Uh, and, yep. But you have to be very, very busy. So, Joanne, if I want to de-risk, though, out of the MAG-7 and go into other areas of tech, for example, where do I go? Well, one area we continue to like outside the MAG-7 is, again, a place where demand is inelastic, like cybersecurity. Look at Palo Alto Networks. They had a tough start to the year because they you know, clarified that they had to change their go-to-market strategy a little bit, and that was going to cause some near-term pain. So the stock really sold off back in February, and it's an opportunity still uh, now to set up for the long term. We've owned it for many years, and we just see cybersecurity as something that's only going to grow more in demand. Uh, another area to go is other places that have gotten beaten up that are due for a cyclical recovery, like, for example, a Qualcomm or an AMD, which is sort of part of the AI world a little bit, AMD, but it's also part of the PC and server world. And it's a company that's taking share from their old nemesis, Intel. Qualcomm, we're seeing a recovery in the smartphone segment after some you know, year after post-COVID post surge in, in purchases, there was a lull. Now that's starting to come back. The inventories are clearing. So those are a couple of places. And then our longtime favorite is Broadcom. Uh, Broadcom, we've owned it at the firm for clients since 2015. It's not only part of the AI revolution in software and hardware, but it's really part of the entire internet's infrastructure in, in fast data transfer and it's also now working in cybersecurity and in software more broadly. So it's a well-diversified company that has just done an excellent job of capital management for its shareholders. Do you feel like when we see the rotation continue, and, and you're talking about stocks that have been beaten up that you want to rotate into, does that also mean that you want to rotate into small caps? Is that really going to stay? Yeah, you know, when the economy holds up more than people expect, that generally benefits smaller cap companies, which are you know more stressed in terms of how they can uh, – you know, acquire funds to run their businesses. So they, they tend to be the first to do well when the economy picks up and the first to do badly under under periods of strain. So because, again, the aggregate data is hold, holding up pretty well, inflation is coming down, the Fed's very likely to cut rates, small caps is a place to go. At Advisors Capital, we have a separate small and mid-cap portfolio strategy that investors can put, say, part of their funds in, even as they perhaps try to be more balanced um, you know, with with an income-oriented strategy elsewhere at the firm. So yes, we we do believe that the SMID opportunity here is just beginning. Uh, ultimately, though, that will depend on the broader aggregate economy and how that goes over the next year or so. But right now, it's an undervalued space that we think has a lot of interesting opportunities. Our approach, though, is to handpick those opportunities to be really careful to find the ones that are best positioned for mm. a more uncertain economic environment. We only have about a minute left here, Joanne. I do want to get your thoughts here on the Fed meeting next week, your expectations, or more importantly, I guess, your hope of what you want to hear out of Jay Powell. Well, Ryan, I think it's pretty clear, uh, given what we've heard so far, that the Fed is going to be cautious about cutting that it wants to cut at a time when it has enough data to be confident that inflation is heading back towards 2%. The recent data has been supportive of that move. We don't think they're going to be in a rush, though. So we think a September cut is far more likely than a July cut. And we're likely to hear more of the same kind of messaging as we've heard recently, that they're getting more information, that things are moving in the right direction, yeah. and that the labor market is loosening in a way that pushes them more towards that side of their dual mandate going forward. All right, Joanne, great stuff. Joanne Feeney, partner and portfolio manager at Advisors Capital Management, helping us kick you off to the close here at the end of the week with a look ahead to next week. 
More than 170 companies reporting in the large cap space, including most of the big tech names, Meta, Apple, and a few others. Ross Gerber, CEO of Gerber Kawasaki, joining us in just a second. Plus, 3M shares eyeing their biggest jump ever. This is after the new CEO boosted its profit forecast. It is today's stock of the hour. And one of the big weak spots right now in the equity market is medical devices. Dexcom down more than 40% here on the day, erasing more than $17 billion of market cap. We're going to talk to an analyst about what's ailing that company as part of our top calls. All that and more coming up in a second, right here on The Close on Bloomberg. season is here. We're skating into another earnings season. The expectation for earnings going forward are quite high. Bloomberg is first to break the numbers. Adobe earnings crossing. Earnings out of Broadcom. JP Morgan, we get Citigroup, we get Wells Fargo. There is something for everybody. With the smartest insights. Now banks have earnings power. There's a resilience in the bigger cap companies. We're not talking about a collapse in earnings for technology. We will have full and instant analysis. Continuing coverage on Bloomberg. Context changes everything. Andrew left under scrutiny today, the famed short seller accused by U.S. authorities of committing fraud through stock trades, social media and social media posts and research reports. Bloomberg's Tom Schoenberg uh, has more. Let's go through the allegations and left's response. Uh, yes. Yeah, so today we had both the Justice Department and the Securities and Exchange Commission uh, bringing cases against Andrew left, uh, essentially saying that he would, uh, you know, essentially use his reputation um, to sort of bring a following to stocks that he wanted to move um, based on reports or tweets, and that sort of his trading wasn't in line with what he was telling the public they should, they should do, whether it was, you know, a company saying that, uh, you know, they should, he should go long. He would then, uh, you know, the government says they saw his trading that shows that he sold off a number of shares shortly thereafter, sometimes within minutes. Uh, and they say that he also sort of made, you know, misleading or uh, false statements regarding uh, that he had, uh, you know, investors uh, for a fund when they said that uh, a fund he had had, had no investors. And yeah. saw, you know, his own trade. Uh, they also say that he went, uh, you know, in interviews uh, from the feds that he uh, made a false statement of, uh, claiming that he never, uh, you know, received the money for research from a hedge fund. Yeah. So have you had a chance to catch up at all with Andrew Left or his attorneys? Have they responded yet publicly? Uh, yes, I was able to catch up with his uh, with his lawyer a short time ago, um, who, uh, you know, says uh, obviously says that, you know, th th this case is bogus and that essentially, uh, you know, that everything Andrew did was vetted by lawyers, uh, yeah. and any disclosures he made. And that furthermore, you know, there is no rule or law requiring, uh, you know, a publisher who discloses when, you know, to disclose, uh, you know, that he must also publish his private trading yeah. intentions. Well, well, let's be clear about something here, Tom, because this is clearly part of a much broader investigation that the SEC has taken. I'm not clear exactly what they're looking for, but we do know they're looking at the much broader universe of these relationships between these hedge funds, uh, the traditional money managers, and some of these short sellers and activist investors here. Uh, do we have any sense as to how far along this investigation has gotten and whether anyone other than Andrew Left and Citroen uh, Research is in the crosshairs? Um, at the moment, it seems that this, you know, uh, seems to be sort of the, the biggest case they have. Um, obviously, it's the biggest one they brought. Um, and it's, you know, for a while here, we weren't even, you know, based on information that sort of we had, it wasn't clear that, um, you know, they were going to move forward with something. We were, you know, a number of us for the better part of a year mm -hmm. looking to see if uh, the government was actually going to bring any cases from this investigation that's been going on for yeah. more than three years now. Um, the SEC did bring, uh, you know, a, you know, a resolution a, a month ago with one of the hedge funds right. uh, involved in uh, in this investigation, and in part, you know, that uh, resolution involved yeah. sort of payments to uh, yeah. Andrew Left. 
All right, uh, Tom, I'm going to have to leave it there. Uh, Tom Schoenberg, there, a nice story today here on U.S. authorities accusing short seller Andrew Left and Citroen Capital uh, of committing fraud through stock trades, uh, allegation that his lawyer uh, vehemently denies. And, Alex, I I'm kind of interested in the story because we talk about the timeline of when this started. If you remember, we kind of had the whole GameStop saga, which kind of sent a lot of short sellers into uh, – the closet, panic. so to speak, mm -hmm. and the panic. And, and we heard from a lot of folks, including Jim Chanos, kind of saying that that old playbook of how short sellers would kind of, you know, stake their, make their stake and then come on to the media and be their case, that that was kind of over. You just couldn't do that anymore, not necessarily because of the regulatory scrutiny, but more so because of the backlash from uh, bulls. Yeah, well, that yeah. is part of it. Yeah. Matt Levine had a great piece out uh, that we should, everyone should definitely read. He says, look, like, Andrew Lev did have a track record. Like, he attacked large companies. They yeah. weren't small companies with not a lot of liquidity. Yeah. And he also had a track record, right? Like, you can't accomplish what the SEC is accusing him of without those two things. So there's also that other side to look at. Yeah, I mean, he, and he had some pretty one of them. Obviously, most people know him from Valiant, and, that, and uh, yeah. of course, uh, that was a, a great short at the time, at least in hindsight, we know that. But it raises the question, too, is... How, where is that research being shared? Is it truly just him and his people coming up with this, him coming into the media, or is there more involvement by other players? And that seems to be, from what I can gather, what, from what Tom was talking about, yeah. that's what the government is looking at. And also, like, what the PR around it is. Yeah. Like, you're going to talk about it, but then, like, is, is your tweet legit? Does yeah. your tweet kind of hype it up a little bit? Like, yeah. it's a, then it becomes a PR situation. So. Yeah. Absolutely. That. And of course, we have uh, put out a formal request uh, for Andrew to come back onto the program if he ever is so inclined. We would love to get his take on this as well as we continue our coverage here on this Friday afternoon. A look at some of the biggest movers of the day and none bigger right now than Dexcom, a 42 percent drop as part of our top calls. And it's up next on The Close. All right, let's get a view from the sell side. Our top calls up now. Some of the big movers on the back of analyst recommendations. We're going to start off today with Duolingo. Bank of America analyst Curtis Nagel li actually lifting his rating to buy. This is mostly a valuation call for a stock that had slid 30% from its record high. Nagel, though, cites the potential for share buybacks as well as the stability from growing cash flow, no debt, and no obvious M&A distractions. Next up, let's take a look at WW International, losing another buy rating, this time with Morgan Stanley downgrading to equal weight and slashing the price target to a street low $1.25. The analyst finds subscriber trends for WW's core dieting app and clinical business unappetizing and says that the company might be unable to offset headwinds presented from the weight loss drug industry. Shares there having one of their worst days in a while, down 12.5%. And finally, let's go to Dexcom, down in the dumps after the maker of blood sugar monitoring devices. Shocked analysts with a lower sales forecast, multiple downgrades today, including a cut to neutral over at JP Morgan, with the analysts flagging multiple self-inflicted issues that leads the company struggling to navigate near-term challenges and rebuild investor trust. Those shares having their worst day since the company went public back in 05. And those are some of our top calls. We do want to stick uh, with Dexcom, that last call, or because our next guest says the downward spir spiral is almost too abrupt, telling clients the speed at which the business appears to have deteriorated is borderline stunning. Jared Holtz joining us right now, healthcare equity strategist over at Mizuho Securities. And Jared, yeah, I mean, look, a 40% drop in a stock like this probably shouldn't happen, but there must have been something there that really caught people off guard for this to sell off that hard. Do you think at all this sell-off is justified? Thanks for having me, first off. Um, I think it is just given the magnitude of um, the guidance cut and what I think is going to be a new valuation range um, or valuation dynamic for the stock over the near term, which is to say I think the, the P.E. multiple will contract the price to sales multiple will probably contract as well. And you're looking at a, a new revenue base and a new earnings base for the company. So I think the move is justified. I think the question is, you know, is the stock range bound? Can you buy it here? Yeah. It feels like the move today is probably more right than wrong. Well, I am curious, though, because well, based on what you just said there, this gets to the idea that the problems that they have, or at least the problems that were revealed today, it sounds like you think this is much more of a long-term issue, much more structural, rather than maybe just a slight sort of, a, I guess, mis-execution in the short term. 
Well, I think some of it is and, and probably some of it isn't. Uh, the Salesforce disruption that they spoke of in the quarter feels like it's, it's reconcilable at some point, whether it's the balance of the year, whether it's 2025. I mean, the company has been incredibly successful um, since its inception. It's hard to think that this Salesforce doesn't get on track at some point. I think the thing that is the you know potentially more difficult issue um, to nail down as far as timing is the competitive dynamic, um, whereby it seems like Abbott is taking market share. Um, there's pricing pressure across this category, and we haven't even really begun to discuss. And the the company on the conference call last night really didn't discuss the rise of the GLP um, therapeutic class, which doesn't seem to have been an issue yet. Right. But I feel like right. when we look at this category, there's no way it doesn't have an impact at some point. So, Jared, that's where I was going to go. So technically, their update did not include G GLP ones, which is what you said. But I'm wondering if the price decline does. Well, I think the price decline has more to do with the way that competitors are contracting um, with the supply chain and things of that nature. So I think that's kind of mutually exclusive from the GLPs. But okay. we know that, the, that these medicines alleviate um, or delay the onset of diabetes for many patients. So given that, I think the medium to long-term effect of this medical device class within diabetes is probably you know, neutral to negative. And the fact that they haven't seen it yet, to me, is even more of an issue because I, I feel like over the next couple of years, it's gonna come into play at some point, again, like getting the timing right for when the mm -hmm. issue is going to be impactful is, is difficult. I mean, is it a one for one, though? Like if you use Ozempic and your blood sugar and your diabetes is better, do you not need their devices or you just need all the stuff? Well, that's the question. Um, I think it's a combination of both. But the fact that you have the, the, the former um, the former camp in terms of patients that are on the medications and then no longer need this type of medical device therapy um, is, is what is going to be the lingering issue, I think, not only for Dexcom, but for a number of players in med tech that are in the diabetes space. We've obviously seen a lot of pressure in sleep apnea. Again, the companies have not really reported that they're seeing any detriment to their business on the back of the GLPs. But I think logically, just given, given that they're going to be on the injections and then the orals down the road, you know, I would think it affects a lot of these medical device classes. We're just a little bit too early um, you know, to be seeing the impact here. And of course, uncertain and markets don't like uncertainty. Jared, thanks a lot. We appreciate you hopping on with us. Uh, Jared Hulse over at Mizuho. I mean, anecdotally, I know people who do both, who are on a Zempic to manage diabetes, but still have the thing because they still have to test before they eat. So yeah. I, I think that's the question. Yeah, it is. And it's also an issue, I think, when we talk about the share reaction, kind of a lack of transparency as to what's really the problem here. And I think at some point, Dexcom is going to have to kind of come out and, and put their cards on the table here. There's something clearly going on. Or at least investors think there is. I mean, the degree, though, that stock is how it got hit akin to 3M of how it's on the upside is truly staggering. All right, coming up, speaking of staggering, big bulk of big tech companies reporting next week. We're going to get insight about investor sentiment from Ross Gerber, co-founder, president, and CEO of Gerber Kawasaki. This is The Close on Bloomberg. It's very easy to get caught up in, and this is how we've handled investors, last year and a half. Soon as tech sells off, that's it, alarm. But it is 9 p.m. in the AI party that we think goes to 4 a.m. So I get if you want to look at that from the outside, we like being in that party, and I think this plays out. It's part of our tech bull thesis. Dan and I speaking a little bit earlier on the program this week about all the hype in the AI and the tech space. And I think starting next week, uh, we're going to have to see whether some of these companies can actually have anything to show for all that hype. A lot of big tech names scheduled to report. And particularly coming after this week where you have that consensus trade, the consensus long, really unwinding. Whether you're looking at the equity market with tech or you're looking at FX, say with the yen, that really sets us up for a very interesting trade. Absolutely. And we talk about Meta, Microsoft, Apple, I know a few others I'm forgetting in there are going to get a few chip makers here. Mm -hmm. We know that they're benefiting to a certain extent, right? The question is by how much, and once you get beyond those big tier companies, 
are those second tier companies seeing anything at all? Yep, you have July 30th, $6.1 trillion in market cap reporting, Microsoft being one of them. And then Thursday, August 1st, Apple, Amazon, about $7.9 trillion of market cap. Joining us for more, Ross Gerber, co-founder, president and CEO of Gerber Kawasaki, uh, joining us now. Hey, Ross, is this text baton to lose here next week? Well, no, I mean, there's no baton to lose. And as my friend Dan said, he's using the 9, 9 p.m. party. It's really like the second inning in AI. You know, we prefer the baseball analogy. But but that said, you know, these companies are making investments that are going to pay off over the long term. And their core businesses are just killing it right now. So I think having an over exuberance on what you expect from AI results might be a little premature, but the actual investment that's being done is massive. And, yeah. and that's why investors need to be patient and the valuations have gotten a little ahead of themselves. Well, that's exactly what investors don't seem to want. Just look at Google. They do not want them to spend a lot and monetize later or the question marks around monetization. So how does valuation reconcile for that? Well, that, that's very short-sighted. Okay, these are companies with tons of cash flow and tons of cash that should be putting their cash to work. I mean, they earn four or five percent sitting in the bank, or they can be investing for their futures over the next five to ten years. And that's exactly what I want my companies doing. So, so I think investors who just want to make like short-term gains are missing the you know forest for the trees, as they say, because really we're long-term investors in my fund GK and at my firm. So what we've really done is we've positioned clients so that they can take advantage of tech and AI, but they also have diversification into small caps and other types of industrials and other areas in the market that we like, like real estate right now with rates going lower. Well, when it comes to sort of, I guess, uh, having making sure the clients sort of benefit or at least have the potential to benefit from what is clearly a longer term structural shift right now, at least in the tech space, Ross, do you, is your strategy or at least your general thinking that you just kind of stick with the names that you know are benefiting, whether that's an NVIDIA or Microsoft or whoever, or do you kind of go down a step or two to maybe those second tier companies that have the potential, but maybe just haven't shown it yet? The way we're playing it right now with our clients is we're really looking at the hardware element first, because first we have to build the infrastructure. And then down the line, we'll look at names that will benefit greatly from the services that the hardware providers can provide. Um, so we're really in stage one, as I said, of, of what's going on. And that's why we really like there's a lot of investment being done from the big tech uh, companies, but there's also a lot of beneficiaries of this investment, whether it be ASML or NVIDIA on the beneficiary side and the investors being Microsoft, Google, Meta and such. But we think that these companies will benefit greatly from these investments. So we are sticking with the names. If you look at my fund, there are a lot of names uh, around AI that are the bigger names, and I think they'll benefit the most on the short term. So for those hyperscalers and those other companies that effectively are the ones spending the money, meaning the ones having to make that investment, Ross, are you sort of comfortable with the amount of money that they're having to spend with the knowledge that it might be several quarters or even several years before you start to see a material uh, impact on the bottom line? Exactly. And I think that people have to separate like CapEx spending from actual operating results. And, and so, as I said, these are very profitable companies with tons of cash and capital, and we want them to deploy that where they see growth. And, and I've never really seen tech executives so bullish about the future of something since the dot-com area that I grew up in. So this is my third decade of investing. And the way we do it at my firm is you have to have investments that are future focused, along with conservative investments that produce income and stability mm -hmm. in the portfolio. And that's the way we build our accounts. So we'll get all the upside on AI success, but we try to lower the volatility of owning these kind of names by owning other types of names like Lennar, for example, mm -hmm. which are a great opportunity as interest rates go low. You are the second person who recommended Lennar uh, on the program today. So clearly well, we're long term owners of it. Yeah. That, that, that's in the zeitgeist. Um, do you feel, though, that the consensus uh, longs in tech, are they out enough? Like, are the consensus longs and other assets out? Like, is that trade played out or you think we're going to see more of that next week? Well, once again, I, I've started investing 30 years ago in the same names that I'm buying today, whether it be Dell or Microsoft or Apple, you know, it's like I'm kind of like going through this like flashback almost of what really made me wealthy the first time, which was the dot com era. So it, it's actually an easy playbook for me, because I think if you think long term, these are names you want to own in your portfolio over the long term. And I think investors need to think about over the next five years or 10 years, what are the names that are really going to do well for me? And a lot of those names are the same names that have done well for us in the past. And that's what the market statistics have shown is a very small portion of the market has made a large portion of the gains over the last several decades. And, and I don't see that changing, you know.
Then based on that too, where do you think the money stops flowing first? So eventually when we get to the point where these hyperscalers are like, all right, I get the message, I'm gonna spend less. Who does that first and how does that ripple through the market? I think it all uh, ripples around return on capital and investment where if you look at like the streamers where they invested like tens of billions of dollars and then it was much harder for them to get a return and then they've pulled back. What we see is more, you know, there's this first burst of spending and then there'll be incremental spending as they see value. So we expect a much more cost discipline on investment from the big cap companies as we move forward. But but just the same, we're building a whole new infrastructure, data center, uh, AI, you know, infrastructure to support lots of different businesses. So so I see this as a, a pretty, you know, long term a trend that will continue and could be an amazingly profitable time for investors who are willing to deal with volatility and be patient. But valuations, once again, have gotten ahead of themselves. And that's why we're seeing a pullback. And that's very healthy for the market and investors. We do not want a dot com situation mm -hmm. where the market just like doubles and then we go into this collapse. That's that's not ideal. So yeah. so I'm, I'm fine with this right now. It's great. It's a great opportunity for investors. Uh, good, Ross. I'm glad you're happy now. And I still can't believe that you've been doing this 30 years. You don't look really uh, a day over uh, 25. Uh, I, final Thank question. You so much. Sure, absolutely. <laughs> We're here for the compliments. I am curious, Ross, though, when you look at the big tech uh, cohorts out there, the individual names, are there any out there that you're just kind of avoiding right now that you kind of look at and just say either it's not right, the right time or the right company or just not necessarily being in the zeitgeist? Yeah, I mean, you're kind of leading me into the Tesla question here. You know, Tesla's the worst of the Mag 7 performance and, and has the highest, you know, P.E. ratio for at least our forward earnings and earnings estimates, which I think are vulnerable to more downgrades. So Tesla is going through a very difficult time because the CEO, Elon Musk, has chosen a very divisive route um, and many of their customers have chosen other EVs or other vehicles to own other than Tesla. And we're seeing this with Sale, you know, average sale prices continuing to drop, margins continuing to drop while they invest in AI and robotics and hopefully have some return at some point into the future. So I think Tesla, mostly because it's the highest PE of the MAG 7, but yet is declining earnings is the most vulnerable and investors should be very cautious about their position. And we still own Tesla, but we've lowered our position, you know, substantially over the last six months and we'll continue to own Tesla for the time being. Um, but we'd love to see a change from the anti-marketing campaign that's been going on with Elon instead of like marketing the wonderful vehicles that they do have. All right, Ross, always appreciate you taking time for us. Always a great conversation. Ross Gerber, co-founder, president and CEO over at Gerber Kawasaki. A push ahead uh, to that uh, plethora, if you will, uh, of tech earnings that we're going to get next week, including Meta, Apple, uh, Qualcomm, Amazon and a few others I'm sure I'm forgetting. And it yeah. just raised the question, like, how much risk do you take into that? I mean, yeah. Google delivered really good numbers, but yeah. the investors just did not like that CapEx spend. But then what do you what do investors want? Like, if you want them to be like first front and center when it comes yeah. to AI, that's what you got to do. I, I'm going to be uh, I know this probably puts me out completely out of out of uh, the, the, the realm of what most investors are thinking today. But I kind of feel like they just need to articulate when they're going to be profitable with some of this stuff, right? Because they're spending so much money, but they're not really getting a, a direct return from it just yet. And I know Ross is talking about the long game, yeah. and I understand a lot of investors, they're in it for the long game. But you know how public markets are. It's yeah. still a short-term market, and they need to see short-term gains. What if they don't know? Yeah. What if they don't know when they can deliver that super steady profit in a meaningful way? then therefore I think maybe that's part of the problem. Yeah, absolutely. All right, uh, coming up here, we're gonna take a look at another big company moving today. We talked about Dexcom, one of the biggest decliners on the day. And well, one of the biggest decliners, biggest gainers, excuse me, on the day is 3M. Take a look at that. That's just over the last two days, a 22% gain here. Investors really celebrating the first results under the new CEO. It's our stock of the hour and it's up next. This is Bloomberg. All right, let's go from the worst mover in the S&P to the best mover in the S&P today. It's time for our stock of the hour, and it is 3M. The share is higher by more than 20 percent here on the day, soaring the most in its entire 40 decades as a public company. This after raising its full-year profit forecast as its new CEO vows to reinvigorate 
the manufacturer's innovation engine. Abigail Doolittle joining us right now for more. I mean, he's got to be feeling pretty good here to get this kind of a, a share price reaction here on one measly earnings report. It's it, a lot. It, it, it sounds yeah. like he's earned it because yeah. I've talked to a couple of analysts, including our BI analyst, Karen Ubelhart, and going into the call, this was his first call with investors. So yes, they did beat. Yes, they did boost. But apparently on the call, he was very measured. He was very honest in terms of assessing the situation, saying these are the problems in the past. Our product pipeline more recently has been weak, but we can't fix that. But what we are looking at, you know, is the future uh, and what we can do there. So she came off the call saying basically a sigh of relief. Everything's going to be okay. And mm -hmm. the way that the stock is reacting, it just seems as though they're excited about the idea that this story that's in so much pain is finally turning around. You know, on the year with the stock is up in a big way, but over the last five years, it's still down 13%. If you compare that to the S&P 500 or the industrial space, big, big underperformance. So there's still a long ways to go, but at least there's some degree of confidence that this guy can right the, the ship. The last CEO, he basically got them through the litigation yeah. but they started missing it got a little yeah. sloppy the CEO before that it was clean as a whistle always be you know uh, good management and he was very personable so I think the hope is yeah. now it goes back to that prior CEO. All right, Abigail, thanks for that. We really appreciate that. Abigail Doolittle joining us on that. Also, just by raising its full-year profit forecast at the lower end, you can make an argument that maybe that's conservative, which gives some analysts and investors a little bit of hope that maybe they can upgrade and beat. So there's that sort of trickling through, I would think. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, yeah, I mean, it's a, a remarkable, right? We always talk yeah. about how sometimes the reactions and the share and the prices are kind of divorced from mm -hmm. the fundamentals, mm -hmm. but this seems one where it's kind of in sync. Yeah. All right, well, coming up, we're going to continue to count you down to the closing bells with Kim Forrest, founder and CIO over Boca Capital Partners on this truly tremendous historic week in the market. This is The Close on Bloomberg. This is the countdown to the close. Romain Bostic here. And I'm Alex Steele. All right, we're about to close up the week. Quite a week it has been. Uh, the S&P is up, though, by about 1.1%. We're not at the highs of the session, but we're doing a solid move. Not at the highs of the session. I mean, this is still the outperformance we've been talking about all week with the small and mm -hmm. mid caps, though this is probably the one day of the week where we've seen the large caps at least try to keep pace uh, with the small cap brethren. But it seems like investors have spoken. Like, when you look at the economic data, the PC data this morning, the GDP data a couple days ago here, mm -hmm. Everything seems to be aligning with this thought that the Fed has to do something and has to do something soon. And Bloomberg Intelligence was pointing out earlier today in a note that, okay, the Fed cuts are now priced into small caps. So now small caps are an earnings show me story. And that's going to be interesting. But, but think about what we saw. I mean, we were just talking about 3M, right? Mm -hmm. We talk about what are the stocks getting bought, the biggest laggards out there, 3M. Newell Brands, I mean, up something like 38% or something this today alone. Mm -hmm. But then when you look at its year-to-date performance prior to today, it was, you know, down like, you know, 30%. Right. Well, so. so how do you position? That's yeah. the question. Absolutely. And that's the question that we're posing to most of our guests here today and really all week long as small cap summer continues. Kim Forrest joining us to help count us down to the closing bells on this Friday afternoon. Founder and chief investment officer over at Boca Capital Partners. And uh, Kim, I know we've talked before about this uh, rotation. I think the last time we talked, it was still kind of we were kind of questioning whether there was some staying power to this. But at least on a weekly basis, this is four straight weeks of outperformance by the small caps relative to big tech here. You see this lasting? I think I do. And it's we're just getting into the heat of earnings season now. And we'll get some of the big caps next week. But there's a lot of small caps that report later in earnings cycle. So you have, if you own them or if you want to own them, now's the time to start paying attention. Because what you really want are companies that are well positioned, not only because they're small caps, you know, you, you can't do anything about that, but you must make sure that they are well positioned against their peers. If you think a company has what it takes to outperform, this might be what they call a stock picker's market. So get prepared. It's kind of interesting, too. So, Kim, I mean, as you think about this being a stock picker's market, give us a sense here as to how you sort of walk through the potential investment in something, particularly a stock that we know has been beaten down. And there's still a lot of questions as to whether those fundamentals are there, whether the macro is going to support it as well. What's the process you go through to do that? Sure. So some of the just really brief things, you have to make sure that they have a balance sheet that can support growth for the company. Secondly, you have to have, and this is a low bar, adequate management. You don't have to have superstars, 
you have to have people that do what they're going to say what they're going to do and then do it. Mm -hmm. And then finally, and this is tricky, finding companies with a methodical way to create and expand their product base is key. And I think that product marketing cycle mm -hmm. is really important, especially to small companies, because they can't just be a one product company. So Kim, what do you like? What do I like? Well, I um, we've talked about this before. They're not really a product company and they're trading kind of high right now. Urban Outfitters makes a lot of their own product that's close to whatever's hot. So they're very good at understanding what companies need or what their clients need. Um, some of the technology names, um, a little company called NetScout, that's N-T-C-T -T is the ticker, they did very well this quarter, and they um, not only serve businesses with a whole lot of different products that help them uh, keep track of their networks if their networks are up and running, um, they also serve telecoms, and they've been a victim of a down cycle in telecom spending for equipment. So that's one area, but they're great at creating mm -hmm. new products for their clients. Kim, how do you play that hyperscaler trend then? Like if, if say we don't own like a Google or a Microsoft and obviously Google gets hit at like too much CapEx spending, et cetera, how, which beneficiary, who gets, gets that money from the hyperscalers and how do you own those guys? Sure, well, being the ex nerd or maybe still I'm a no, nerd. No, you're still a nerd, Kim, it's fine. Me too. Yes, yay, okay. <laughs> um, anyhow. Uh, I was a software developer in AI, and if there's one thing I know, AI uses tons and tons of data, and then you replicate that tons of tons of data for the process, training, testing, that kind of thing. And so data is big. So um, buy companies that allow people to store data. So that would be NetApp is one, and Micron, which makes the um, pretty much the guts of what NetApp sells. So those are that is a, a way to play um, AI, and it has a long timeline because AI is going to take a long time to build out. I hate to be the one to break it to you. Okay, well, I mean, but it's going to take a long time. But Kim, if you do believe, and I'm not saying you do, but if you do believe that there is sort of a structural shift that AI is either aiding or more importantly at the center of and that we are at some inflection point that will change technology forever here do you just wait until we actually see kind of the whites of its eyes meaning the actual end results of it or do you try to get on in advance well i think people really have correctly got on in advance with nvidia i'm going to give everybody you know big kudos that spotted that that hopped on but a, and they have kind of a, a, a good window ahead of them where they're the leader. They're the clear leader. Now, semis are, we don't know what products are going to be in demand, but we know they're um, delivered and developed on semiconductors, so that's a good bet. Again, data is a good bet, but I would keep an eye out in the software world because somebody's going to come up with that killer app. And if I knew, I wouldn't tell you. I just invest. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. I, I don't see anything right now that's the killer app. All right, Meredith, uh, you can tell us, uh, Kim, after uh, we get off air here and just kind of whisper it into our ears. Kim Forrest, founder and chief investment officer over at Boca Capital Partners. As we count you down to the closing bells, we've still got about three minutes uh, until we get there, Alex. And it raises a question, too. I mean, we've been talking about the moves in stocks, but we still had that drop in yields. Mm -hmm. Not a massive drop in yields, but that's the anticipation here is that when we hear from the Fed next Wednesday, that not necessarily saying they will cut on Wednesday, but maybe they'll give us some clarity as to whether they're actually going to buy into what the market is pricing in, which is right now a little bit more than two cuts this I year. Mean, I argue that the move in yields was significant and mm -hmm. it was you know chunky uh, mm -hmm. this week I was talking to Steve Major over at HSBC on radio earlier and he thinks that steepener trade though is kind of toast right now that yeah. if you if you uh, were playing the steepener based well, on one? president both oh, okay. so yeah. the president Trump one yeah. which would be uh, the long end selling yeah. off we got to recalibrate if you're yeah. doing it because the Fed's gonna cut that's already priced in so now mm -hmm. that front end and the rally in the front end has to recalibrate I thought that was interesting we'll see if that actually plays out next week as a perpetual pessimist mm. uh, I'm worried because this just feels like it's almost too perfect, right? I mean, we've, now we're back to the soft landing, the Goldilocks sticking the landing scenario again, and it all just seems like no one's taking into account or hedging for 
any potential of deviation from where we are right now. But maybe that's what we saw this week with tech. Mm -hmm. Like the value at risk has been decreased in these systemic funds, and that's what we've seen. And maybe there's more to go there as well. All right, 1% gains right now on the S&P and NASDAQ, about one and a half on the Russell, as we break down your market coverage right now on Bloomberg. The Closing Bell, Bloomberg's comprehensive cross-platform coverage of the U.S. market close starts right now. And right now we are two minutes away from the end of the trading day. Romain Bostic alongside Alex Steele taking you through the closing bell. A global simulcast. It starts right now. Scarlet Fu joining us in the TV studio. Tim Stenevic in the radio booth. Carol Masser off today. Emily Grafeo filling in today for Carol on a what is just pretty just much uh, just a monumental day and a monumental week, Tim, when we talk about yeah. this rotation and more importantly, the idea that investors really do have some newfound confidence that they're finally going to get those rate cuts. Yeah, I mean, I think the data certainly helped this morning. Um, no rate cut next week necessarily at the July Fed meeting. Uh, but still, like you said, that rotation continuing, we're seeing the Dow outperforming the Russell 2000, but the Russell outperforming the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ, not just on the week significantly, but on the day today too, Emily. That right. That's right. That rotation trade is fully underway, but we are still seeing strength in the mega caps in the S&P 500. But year to date, that Nasdaq 100 now lower than the S&P 500's year to date gains. So it feels like next week will be a really big test, right? Because you've got a big chunk of the rest of the MAG 7 reporting. For those who think that the Nasdaq's underperformance um, is an early warning sign of things to come, hopefully they're relying on these earnings reports to help answer that question whether it is or whether this is just a buying opportunity. I don't know. I keep hearing on the street, I was just telling Romaine this, that that value at risk model for a lot of these systemic funds like CTAs, for example, uh, are still getting hit. So it is surprising that we're not seeing more selling today after yesterday. Yeah, absolutely here. But a pretty broad based uh, rally that we have on our hands here today with all the major indices holding in the green with the majority of the stocks in each one of those indices posting significant gains on the day. A Dow Jones Industrial Average higher by roughly around 660 points or about 1.7 percent on the day. The S&P 500 is going to close higher by about 60 points or 1.1 percent, while the Nasdaq Composite up 1 percent on the day. Similar moves for the Nasdaq 100. But your outperformer, modest outperformance, remains the small and mid caps. S&P 400 mid caps up 1.6 percent. The Russell 2000 uh, Tim and Emily up 1.7. Yeah, majority, I think it's fair to say the vast majority of stocks, at least in the S&P 500, uh, moving to the upside today. You got more than four stocks higher for every one stock that's lower. 438 in the green, 62 in the red in the S&P 500, Scarlett. And the IMAP is going to show you a, a green pizza pie. There's there's no tomato sauce here because <laughs> all 11 Nothing. groups yeah, like are in the green. Oh, okay. I mean, this is a salad pizza, really. That's what it is. I see, all, I see a little bit of red. Higher. Okay, you want to know what that is? What is it? Uh, autos and components okay. down a quarter of 1% and telecom services down a fifth of 1%. Oh, I feel bad for whoever has to do decliners today. <laughs> no, there, there are some big ones. There are some big ones. Okay. That was a drum roll to yeah, him. Yeah, it was. It wasn't me. I don't have to do decliners. Oh, uh, yeah. okay. You're doing gainers. Don't yeah. worry. Yeah. You have a lot to choose from. I really do feel bad. Okay. <laughs> you want me to do the gainers? Do the gainers. Okay, I'll do the gainers. I do want to start with uh, shares of uh, 3M, ticker MMM. Look at that, up 23%, having their best day ever. Second quarter net sales beat estimates. The company lifted the lower end of its full year earnings forecast. The results are the first under Bill Brown, the CEO, who succeeded Mike Roman. That was just back on May 1st. Um, Brown inherited a much smaller 3M following the spinoff of the huge healthcare products division unit. That was amid la uh, massive legal liabilities. 23%, the biggest advance going all the way back to 1980. Bristol Myers Squibb, another one that was higher by double digits today. The company up 11.44% after it raised its 2024 profit forecast. Demand for new medicine suggested the company has gotten past that dip in performance. Adjusted earnings for the full year are going to be between 60 to 90 cents a share, uh, an increase of 20 cents at the midpoint of its prior projection. And finally, Newell Brands, it's the parent company of Coleman, Yankee Candle, Sharpie, Rubbermaid, Crock-Pot, Baby Jogger, and many, many more, climbed the most ever to its highest intraday since September of last year, up more than 40% today. This after the company posted a second quarter profit beat, also raised its yearly outlook. Uh, the second quarter gross margin increased to 34.4% compared with 28.5% in the prior year period, Emily. 
well, you're, you gave me the hard assignment, Tim. <laughs> when I come in, I film for Carol. I'm sorry. And I have to get the difficult job of finding the red on the salad pizza of the green <laughs> IMAP. But I did find some decliners. Let's start with T. Rowe Price. Assets under management of $1.57 trillion, just matching estimates. We saw that stock lower about 3% on the day. Second quarter net revenue for the company and EPS also missed down over 5% on an intraday basis, the biggest drop since February. But the big decliner today, the one that we've been talking about for the last several hours, is Dexcom, down 40%, the worst drop ever for the maker of blood sugar monitoring devices for diabetics after the company unexpectedly slashed its 2024 sales guidance, citing um, a drop in customers and lower revenue per patient. This massive stock decline trig triggered several price target cuts. Cowan saying it was a rare, disappointing quarter for the company. And finishing up, we have another health focused company, Biogen, that stock down as much as 7.7% .7 on the day, biggest drop since February, after a committee of the European Medicines Agency recommended against the approval of Biogen's Alzheimer's drug. I will note that the company's drug is already approved in other countries, including the US, China, and Japan, but for Europe right now, it was a no. BMO said that the opinion adds a significant headwind to the drug's chance of approval in the EU and is likely to pressure shares. Yeah, talk about not been on the same page with that one. All right, guys, let's get to the bond market here because we saw some nice rallying all across the board. Yields lower, uh, whether you're looking at the twos or the belly uh, or the back end of the curve. And I should point out that for the week, that 210 spread at one point moved about 16 basis points steeper. Now we're only about eight. But nonetheless, that's quite interesting. Like, that's a chunky move in one week uh, for that yield curve. And it kind of brings into focus next week and what's actually priced in when it comes to the Fed. Can that front end continue to rally, guys? Yeah, that's certainly the question. Hey, um, another question that I have uh, ahead of everything that's going on when it comes to AI, we hear from another, you know, a few of the mag seven next week, we'll get an update on how these companies are investing in AI, is what happens to the companies that are not necessarily focused on AI, but starting to adopt the tools using the AI, which brings us yeah. to one of the stories on the Bloomberg terminal this afternoon about how JP Morgan is giving their analyst staff their own version of chat GPT. It's called LLM Suite. And what it does is it helps with research, it helps with writing, um, though they're quick to note that it doesn't contain specific asset and wealth management division knowledge. This yeah. is all according to an internal memo viewed by Bloomberg. Uh, we have some breaking news uh, crossing the wire. This on yeah. Bill Ackman and his ambitions to take at least part of Pershing Square public. We're now learning, based on the NYSE's website, that Pershing Square has now postponed uh, the IPO of that closed-end fund that Bill Ackman had been trying to raise money for. Uh, we had learned, based on Bloomberg reporting, that he'd been trying to raise roughly about $25 billion on that. He had raised about $4 billion and had planned to push ahead with that IPO. But at least uh, based on uh, what we see on the NYSC website uh, that our Bloomberg reporters uh, have been tracking, that that IPO, uh, at least for right now, has been postponed. Yeah, the idea is that they were going to raise with regulate, file with regulators to raise about $2.5 uh, to $4 billion. So getting that scratched is very interesting. We'll keep tracking uh, those headlines as they come out. And part of the interesting uh, aspect of this story is that Bill Ackman was counting on his social media presence to really drum up interest in uh, this IPO and perhaps pricing for this IPO as well. I don't know what this says about his uh, social media presence, though, this delay. And I wonder how long, how long it'll be postponed. Like, yeah. you know, here's what we know is they were expected to price the IPO on Monday, trade on Tuesday. We didn't hear back. A representative of Pershing Square declined to comment, and representatives yeah. from the New York Stock Exchange did not immediately respond to requests for comment. Yeah, I mean, we have to get some more details on it. But yeah. if you look at the, the Bloomberg reporting that we had a couple of days ago, it really seemed to be uh, that at least the initial shopping of this just did not get uh, the type of demand that I guess maybe they had set out to do. Maybe that's part of it. Maybe a postponement really is a postponement, but we'll see. Yeah, uh, that'll be quite interesting to see. And also, maybe it was just a bad market conditions uh, from what uh, we are looking at as well. Um, okay, before we go, you guys, did anyone watch the opening ceremonies? We, were, from me? I, we were working. Are you kidding yeah, we me? Were, I've, been, I've been watching nothing else. I haven't even been watching this program. Was anyone else really <laughs> terrified by the weird no. opening ceremony? What? Terrified when they cut off Marie Antoinette's head. And she's singing. And she, and she held it and sang. <laughs> and then whatever the band was, it was the like heavy shredding metal heavy metal on, on the... Come on, this is classic. I found it very yeah. upsetting. Yeah. And I didn't understand it at I agree. All. I have no idea what the, any of this has to do with the Olympics, but it was entertaining. Well, you know, it's a brief history of what happened 
written in France, basically. Of nothing, because heavy metal came from Britain, and you had Les Mis. That was not written by a French person. Oh. Marie Antoinette, that's did French. Did you see the did big teaser, true. though? How did you guys How did you guys watch all this uh, today? I like multitask. This started at 1.30. Our show started at 2. I know you were tuned into our show from 2 to 3 <laughs> while you were prepping for your show. Multitask. How did you watch this? Multitask. Yeah. We have okay. lots of like monitors open. Night. Yeah. Well, time change, you know. Huh? <laughs> Emily, what'd you say? It goes at night? It's night in Paris. I feel like they're... Oh, okay. Yeah, that's true. Time See, change. we're just stuck here in this radio booth. They lie. They we're, have like 19 different screens there. We do, but we none of them are tuned to the Olympics. I guess that's yeah. for a reason. We saw no torches. Uh, maybe we can spend a little time this weekend watching the Olympics. Hopefully not too delayed. And, you know, those spoilers, you got to stay off of Twitter. So if you, you paid for spoilers. Peacock, yes, you can. All right. Well, perfect. I'll be doing that. Um, you guys have a great weekend. That is going to do it for our cross-platform coverage of the market close on Bloomberg TV, radio, YouTube, and Bloomberg Originals. Alex Steele, you're heading out soon, but we were going to all be back same time, same place on Monday. Have a great weekend, everyone. Our coverage continues here on Bloomberg Television, a momentous week. Who better to wrap it up with than Chris Kane? Factor Friday, a breakdown of the factors that moved the markets this week. That's coming up next right here on The Close on Bloomberg. Welcome back to The Close. I'm Scarlett Fu. And I'm Romain Bostic. The best day for stocks, at least going back to February, that's actually not enough uh, to recover from that Wednesday, which yeah. I think was like the worst day uh, that we had going back to 2022. On a weekly basis, you actually saw the S&P decline once again here, down about eight-tenths of a percent on the week, though it did post in the green. But it's really about that outperformance, the difference that we saw between mm -hmm. the Russell 2000, 3.4 percent, 5 percent, I should say, on a weekly basis versus the MAG-7, which is basically the exact opposite, down almost 4%. Similar story with the SOC, similar story with the S&P and the NASDAQ. What's remarkable is that we tend to think the Russell 2000 kind of turned around um, after the June CPI report in uh, early, what, July? And that's actually not been the case since... Uh I would say mid-June, the Russell 2000 has posted uh, five weekly gains out of six. Yeah. So it's been a slow recovery. Yeah, it's kind of interesting moves here. We did see uh, the VIX actually end the week lower than where it started, despite yeah. some of the volatility that we saw there. Intra-week is a different I, story. And I wanted to point out, too, we had Noel Brands on there, uh, which had like a 30-plus percent gain on the week and on the day here. But it really was indicative, I think, of that rotation. What people were buying was basically they were looking at the biggest laggards out there, mm -hmm. which are basically those stocks that were down 50, 60, 70 percent on the week or on excuse me on the year and then trying to find any semblance of optimism whether it's from a drop in rates or whether it's better fundamentals you saw that with newell brands you saw that with 3m you yeah. saw that with names like coursera uh, carvana and a few others here and that really seemed to be the playbook uh, with regards to this rotation and of course the real test is next week when you get a whole bunch of mag 7 names reporting earnings uh, whether the capex will actually result in meaningful roi is the big question yeah a huge uh, uh, slew of earnings in fact the busiest week uh, for earnings coming up next week when we talk about the factors that did move the market at least on this week was it value was it momentum was it profitability well maybe chris kane can answer that question uh, he helps uh, lead our markets coverage over at bloomberg intelligence we haven't spoken to you in quite a few fridays always great to have factor friday back and uh chris let's just start off here with large cap equity because that really was the discussion here small caps stealing thunder from u.s large caps how have they performed the large caps well, factors and large caps are still up on the year, you know, but um, most of those gains for all the traditional factors really happened in the first quarter. I would say the second quarter, the last three to four months, you know, we've re we really seen a pullback in some of these factors. Like, let's take momentum, for example. Like, momentum really started out of the gate hot. We have we had high momentum stocks beating low momentum stocks by over 10% in the first quarter, but that's really given back some of his gains. Like you mentioned the MAG-7 rolling over a little bit. That has a big uh, to do with that. And, and uh, you know, value is up as well. We have our long short value factor up 4%. I think that surprises a lot of people. I think there's a perception that value isn't working, but I would posit that that's really a size effect. Like when you hmm. look at the value and growth indices, their market cap weighted, and the expensive large caps, so like NVIDIA, for example, have done so well. When you strip away that size effect, and if you just equally weight the stocks, you'll see that value has worked. And I will shout out our, our multi-factor, which we call BMVP. Uh, that is a combination of momentum, value, low volatility, and profitability. That's actually done the best on the long short basis, up over 12%, which shows you there are some synergies with like combining these factors. 
Of course, one of the catalysts that we've had for the market in recent weeks is uh, political headlines, right? And it's kind of hard to believe how many different headlines people are reacting to. But I wonder how much the Trump trade is part of what you're seeing. What happened in factors last time Trump was elected? Sure. The, the quant in me has to start with this is a uh, you know sample size of one, so it's not exactly a statistically significant thing. So take it with a grain of salt. But we did look at a long short factor performance from election day in 2016 to inauguration day in 2017. The main finding there is the only main factor that worked was value. You had cheap stocks beating expensive stocks by about six percent in that time frame. All the other factors like profitability, momentum, low volatility, they did suffer. I think the deal there is, is that when Trump got elected, that did increase some risk taking and that benefited the short side of many of these factors, meaning low momentum stocks, high volatility stocks and low profitability stocks. Um, but value was the big winner. And we also did this in small caps as well. Value in small caps was also the big winner in this time frame uh, after Trump got elected last time. Talk to me a little bit about uh, the momentum side uh, of this equation here. I was just kind of taking a look at on FTW, the function on the Bloomberg terminal here. Uh, give me a sense here as to why maybe we didn't see a little bit more pop there relative to some of the other factors. Yeah, so momentum continues to be you know up a good bit on the year. Like I said, it had basically a record-breaking first quarter. It did uh, pull back recently. Like you said, you know the the rollover of the Mag Seven does have a lot to do with that. But to me, like the fundamental standing of momentum is very strong. Like one of the things that really sticks out to me is the profitability of high momentum stocks is about 18 percent as far as return on equity. That's way higher than the index, the Russell 1000, which is only about 13 percent. Low momentum stocks is only about eight and a half. When you look at the ratio and profitability between high momentum stocks and the index, you're talking about a 95th percentile uh, ranking going back to 2000, meaning one of the most profitable on a relative basis that we've seen. So while momentum has had a pullback here, I do think fundamentally it's, uh, you know, it's in good standing. Chris Kane of Bloomberg Intelligence, thank you so much. Always good to speak with you for our Factor Friday. Of course, when you talk about momentum, it's a chameleon because it's whatever had been moving. At some point, momentum is going to be made up of small caps if the small caps hold on to this outperformance. Yeah, well, as, well, you wonder if it's going to happen as a group. The thing is, we spoke with Joanne Feeney a little bit earlier, and Kim Boca, uh, Kim Forrest over at Boca Capital said the same thing, just about how idiosyncratic this rally is, meaning that this really is about individual stocks, mm -hmm. and that might actually skew some of the factors because you're not necessarily going to get uh, what is a kind of rising tide lifts all boats. Right. Yeah, it really is people going after those individual names. Well, we'll continue to look through all of this for you. In the meantime, we have the top three coming up where we focus on, a, on the top three movers and shakers at the center of the day's big stories. This is The Close on Bloomberg. season is here. We're skating into another earnings season. The expectation for earnings going forward are quite high. Bloomberg is first to break the numbers. Adobe earnings crossing. Earnings out of Broadcom. JP Morgan, we get Citigroup, we get Wells Fargo. There is something for everybody. With the smartest insights. Now banks have earnings power. There's a resilience in the bigger cap companies. We're not talking about a collapse in earnings for technology. We will have full and instant analysis. Continuing coverage on Bloomberg. Context changes everything. A fund manager I know calls Harvard University a hedge fund with a school attached to it. Today's big take story finds Harvard enjoys almost half a billion dollars in tax benefits. So maybe Harvard is more like a hedge fund that pays no taxes. But should it? In this week's Muni Moment, we discuss all of this with Nick Carello, who co-wrote the story. Nick, thanks for joining us. Sure. So Harvard is super wealthy. It's got this $53 billion endowment. And as a nonprofit, it is exempt from paying most taxes and can sell tax-exempt bonds. But the school does make some voluntary payments to its municipalities. How does that work? Sure. So Harvard is not unique. This is pretty common among uh, private nonprofit colleges. But um, a lot of the Ivy League schools make what's called a pilot, a payment in lieu of taxes, which is kind of a goodwill payment that these schools make to their hometown. Um, usually it's like a sliver of what they would ordinarily pay in real estate taxes. And this is supposed to help cover some of the municipal costs like policing and upkeeping their grounds, that kind of thing. Right now there's a big push among uh, local officials in Cambridge and Boston to try to get Harvard to pay more. But it's pretty delicate because these payments are totally voluntary. Give us a sense here, though. I mean, this is pretty common, as you pointed out. Even the school I, I went to, they had similar fights way back in, you know, the 40s when I went to a college. <laughs> is there a sense, though, that the economic 
benefit that these schools will say that we give to this community, that that might be enough, or at least enough to offset the difference in what they would have been paying in taxes? That's certainly the, ben yeah. the argument that the schools make, mm -hmm. is that it's almost immeasurable the economic benefits that a school like Harvard brings to its backyard. I mean, and the world for that matter. They're creating life-saving research. They're doing uh, all types of really innovative work. And on top of that, I think they're one of the biggest employers in the region, one of the probably fourth or fifth biggest in the state of Massachusetts. So I think the schools would say that there's plenty of reason that they're not paying these taxes. And you know that's the way the law is written. But I think when we're facing this big commercial real estate crisis, some of these towns are facing some real budget squeezes. Mm -hmm. Harvard, MIT, these rich schools are a really attractive target. Yeah, and in places like Boston, uh, they're contending with people not coming into the office, for instance. So they're really thinking ahead in terms of how do we make up for some of this revenue. Is there a push to turn um, these voluntary payments into something more mandatory? It's really difficult. There has been some legislation that's been proposed um, multiple times. Uh, right now, some legislation has made it somewhat far in the state legislature that would try to compel Harvard and other schools to pay 25% of what they would otherwise pay in real estate taxes, but it's still to be seen whether it will pass. Uh, is there any sort of solution to this, though? Because anytime this debate comes up, Two things come up. As first is that Harvard ain't going anywhere. It's not like they're just going to pack their bags and like you know move to you know Connecticut or somewhere. Uh, they're not like the, the Oakland A's. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, they're, I mean, they're there. They're not. They're 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 pretty much stuck one way or the other. Uh, and then the flip side of that, it gets back to this idea too for these communities. I mean, is there a way to negotiate with these universities so you get? Uh, some of the issues addressed, like with housing and other things that uh, maybe they feel like uh, they don't have enough money for? I think a lot of the negotiation happens in the public sphere. I mean, this is really an image question for schools like Harvard. Do people who live here feel like these schools are contributing fairly in exchange for the benefits that they get? Like, yeah. You're right. They probably could not move. Um, but. Boston and Cambridge would probably not be the same places without these schools either. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like, I mean, you, I mean, you, I mean, you walk around there. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, it's kind of synonymous, really, with Boston. They and own so much yeah. of the land and so many yeah. of the buildings in Boston and Cambridge. I mean, lawmakers at the local level are doing what they can. What about the federal level to maybe strip schools of their uh, nonprofit status, make it so that they're not exempt from taxes? This would be extremely complicated. To pull a tax exempt status away from a school like Harvard would involve changing the tax status on bonds, potentially changing the tax status on bonds that have already been issued. It would be mm. a nightmare and very complicated, but some conservative lawmakers at the federal level have threatened it. We haven't, I don't believe we've seen any legislation really proposed on that, but I think we talked about the endowment tax as if it were a total long shot and lo and behold, it passed. So you never really know. Yeah, good point. And that was, uh, what, 2017, right? So, okay. And if there is a Trump 2.0 administration, it might be something to watch out for. Nick Corello, thank you so much for joining us, uh, giving us our Muni moment today. In the meantime, let's move on to our top three, where we name drop the people driving some of the day's most talked about stories. And first up, speaking of Trump 2.0, is J.D. Vance, Donald Trump's running mate, now facing criticism following comments that he had made in 2021 disparaging childless cat ladies. Uh, and, you know, this pushback is coming not just from Democrats, Democrats, but also Republicans as well. They say the you know, campaign needs to win over suburban women who are undecided, and this is probably not the way to do it. Uh, yeah, he's going to have to choose his words carefully. Yeah, Vance did clarify that he's criticizing the Democratic Party for becoming anti-family and anti-child, not necessarily childless cat women, but that is they, what he said. So. They're anti-family? That, that's what he's saying the Democrats are. Are they anti-child? That's what he says. Oh, is that true? <laughs> Depends who you're asking, Romaine. All right. The uh, person I'm keeping an eye on actually is helping to run this country. Her name's Janet Yellen. She's the Treasury Secretary of the United States. And an interesting little tit for tat here. Nouriel Roubini uh, uh, published a paper earlier this week that seemed to sort of imply that the, the Treasury was sort of manipulating the market with the level of issuance and uh, saying that basically uh, what Janet Yellen and the Treasury are doing is sort of obscuring some of the real uh, debt burden that the U.S. have. Uh, we caught up with Janet Yellen on the sidelines of this G20 out in mm -hmm. Rio. Mm -hmm. uh, she gave an interview to Bloomberg. 
basically said 100 percent. That's not their strategy. Uh, she also goes into the weeds a little bit here about the mechanisms of Treasury issuance. But interesting to see that this criticism coming from Rubini, he's not the first to make this criticism, but her actually directly pushing back on this when asked about it by Bloomberg. Yeah, there were some rumblings around Wall yeah. Street, and it's partly because in November when Treasury did change up the mix of Treasury issuances, it did surprise the market a little bit, right? Yeah. It definitely uh, leaned more on short-term bills and less on these long-term yeah. securities, and that took the market by surprise. Yeah, but they do that every Treasury issue. They, they do that every... Yeah, I mean, every, every time they put out a calendar, you get some sort of shifting around of things, and the idea that somehow this time was any different and all the conspiracy theorists come out and say, oh, they must be hiding something. Not to add to uh, the conspiracy theories, no, but um, Rubini's the co-author theories. of this paper uh, served in the yeah, uh, saw, U.S. Treasury yeah, under the Trump administration. Yeah. So there you go. Whatever. Okay. Third on the docket. I just want to say in Paris right now, there's just some dude like in aluminum foil riding a horse. Oh. So there that, you go. That that's, your, that's your Olympics update. All right. Third on the docket is Ryan Reynolds. I hope we don't have to pay for that. We have to pay NBC for mentioning that? Yes, you do. Oh, okay. Deadpool and Wolverine, which is the latest Marvel films featuring the actor, took in $38.5 million in domestic ticket sales on Thursday previews. That's the best ever for an R-rated movie. I'm not into these Marvel movies at all, but maybe yeah. you are. Well, Deadpool loves cats. <laughs> I don't know about that. All right, coming up here, look, we got to get to this spectacle, the spectacle of the Summer Olympics. I'm glad you're watching our program, but if you're missing out on the opening ceremony, you really are missing out. We're going to talk about the business of sports. Mark Glory going to be joining us, entrepreneur and owner of the Minnesota Timberwolves. Stick with us. This is Bloomberg. Olympic fever is running high as the world's top athletes gather in the city of light, Paris. While fans are looking forward to watching record-breaking track and field races and iconic gymnastics competitions, companies intend to cash in on the excitement. According to Bloomberg Intelligence, the Paris Games is the first truly marketer-friendly Olympics for brands since the 2012 London event, after the pandemic complicated the Tokyo Games four years ago. So outside of sponsoring athletes and paying up for naming rights for arenas, what are brands doing to finish first with consumers? Bloomingdale's is betting on experiential shopping. I went to Bloomingdale's New York City flagship store to meet with Denise Majid, who directs the department store's merchandising strategy. And she walked me through their new Game On shop. This is what we call our carousel pop-up. We do these probably every eight weeks, and they're usually surrounding something that is happening in pop culture, something culturally relevant going on in the world, what we're inspired by at the moment. Um, we were inspired by the big events that are happening this summer. Um, and so you'll see that this um, pop-up is powered by Air France, and I'm super excited to say that Venus William is our special curator. The four-time gold medalist is bringing her name recognition and fashion prowess to tap into the Olympic spirit. We worked very closely with her and her team about what this would come to life because we wanted to be able to be close to her vision of like what she sees this as, but she's very involved in the collaboration of Aqua. Um, all the product working back and forth with our team over months just to make sure that the product reflected what she wanted it to. So in terms of brands, you mentioned Aqua, which is Bloomingdale's in-house brand, but there's a lot of other brands that are involved in this as well. We, you mentioned Air France as a partner, right? Air France is a partner. We have other. We have Venus's products have launched with us. She has two brands in here, Happy Viking, mm -hmm. which is protein powders, and Asutra, which is a skincare and relaxation um, product. Style and sports have long gone hand in hand with basketball players setting trends through game day arrivals, on the runway, and on social media, creating an audience eager to connect further with accomplished athletes, something Bloomingdale's is tapping into as the driving force of this pop-up. This is really meant to inspire, mm. um, and we definitely see, you'll see any day of the week when you come in, people will be kind of going through because it's fun, it's bright, it's colorful, and it's just like something to kind of like spark their interest and inspire them and then that we hope leads to a journey throughout the store to discover what else we have. So I'm getting excited for the you know Olympics, getting into the Olympic spirit. Yeah. I know you have been all day because oh, you've been glued to the opening ceremonies. Yeah, I mean, the, yeah, and this opening ceremonies is bonk. This will go down probably as one of the more bonkers opening ceremonies. But it's great. I mean, right? It, it keeps you watching, and you know, you want something different, right? Yeah. Well, what yeah. did you last see? There's a, uh, a well, knight I don't know. In well, there, armor? there was a, a person who dressed like a knight in like an aluminum foil costume and took the Olympic flag up there uh, and unfurled it. I, I think they could have just walked the flag up there, but it was yeah, obviously more much dramatic. more dramatic to Absolutely. have that here. And uh, look, if there's 
there's anything we know is the French certainly know how to overdo things. And I don't know if you saw when they chopped off Marie Antoinette's head and then yeah. she started singing songs and I saw while without a metal any, band played next to her. Yeah, there's no narration what? going on, so it was without context <laughs> completely. So it was actually quite amusing. All right. Uh, all right. Well, we do actually want to talk about the games themselves and, of course, the business behind it. Uh, let's get straight to Vanessa Perdomo. She's actually going to be traveling uh, to Paris. Bloomberg reporter uh, here with us in the U.S. Now, you have not actually gotten on a flight yet to get out there, so you're still watching this on TV. But at some point, you got to get out there. And I'm wondering, uh, Vanessa, when you look at the appetite for people to travel to Paris to see the games in person, do you think we're going to see the same type of travel numbers that we saw for past or most recent Olympics? Well, it can't be the most recent Olympics, right, Ramin, because of, there was no oh, yeah. uh, audience and yeah. foreign audience at uh, Tokyo. But, you know, to your point of in the past, you know, for, let's say, Rio or other, you know, Winter Olympics and, and London before that, it doesn't seem like it's going to be like that. You know, it, a lot of flights are still they're cutting their prices. There's a lot of seats still open. Now people are releasing, you know, deals after deals to try and get this tourism bump that they really thought they were, you know, Air France and all these other uh, airlines had extra flights going to Paris. And it really doesn't seem like it's paying out. And it seems like, you know, from the coworkers I've talked to that are already on the ground, Jillian Tan and Benoit, they, they've been saying that it seems pretty empty. But yeah. the opening ceremony, as you guys were talking about, yeah. see, you know, it's pouring rain. People are happy. They're there. They're having a great time. They're having a great time, and of course, you'll be joining them soon enough. One thing that you do so well, Vanessa, is speak to the athletes and talk to them about what they're going through and how they look at themselves as brands. And obviously, there's going to be a lot of NBA players there. There's going to be professional athletes, the tennis players. But a lot of the athletes are amateurs, and they have real full-time jobs outside of the games. Talk to us a little bit about what you've heard from them. Yeah, it's really interesting, you know, to your point, obviously these NBA players who come over here, this is just an amazing opportunity for them to compete in the Olympics. It's just another feather in their cap. But for a lot of these players, they are balancing full work schedules, some of them while they're at the games themselves. You know, I talked to a couple of U.S. team Olympic rowers. And this is the first games they've said that they actually got a break from work. So um, Molly and Michelle, they both work for Broadridge, who has a, 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 a fintech company that has a program that actually supports them to be Olympic hmm. rowers. You know, so they only work 20 hours a week and then they have the 20 hours to train everything else. And then they have this three week dark period where they're actually allowed to just focus on the games. But when I was talking mm -hmm. to Michelle, she noted to me that in the last games in Tokyo, she was still taking calls. Wow. She was doing all these other things while she still had to worry about competing at the highest level. And that's not something you want to worry about while you're there. Absolutely not. Well, glad that they're getting some time to do uh, their best at the games, at the upcoming games. Vanessa, thank you so much for joining us. Good luck traveling. Bon voyage for Vanessa Perdomo, who's heading off to Paris. Let's stay. Cute. Bon voyage. You I like know that? you were fluent in French. Oh, yeah, that's about <laughs> all I can say. Let's stay with the business of sports now and welcome our next guest. Mark Laurie is an entrepreneur and an owner of the NBA's Minnesota Timberwolves and the WNBA's Minnesota Lynx. And Mark, fun fact about you, you qualified for the U.S. national bobsled team in 1996 while you were working, I believe, at Credit Suisse. So that's you right, were yeah. one of those amateur <laughs> athletes who was also working. Did you actually go on to compete in the games? I did, and I would have had to quit and travel with the team for two years before the 98 Olympics. So, no, I, I chose to stay, stay in banking. You chose to stay in banking. You moved that on to do lots of other things. Too, right? yeah. yeah, it worked out. I'm not, I'm not complaining. <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about sports overall because um, NBC obviously has the U.S. media rights to the games, which will be a big test for its Peacock streaming service, as we know how much people pay up for coverage. Um, let's talk about Amazon as a media streamer as well as a um, professional sports streamer because it's the new media partner for the NBA. And you know Amazon very well. You competed with them, right? You sold your company, Quincy, to them. What do you think they want to get out of this partnership? Like, what's the thinking behind Amazon taking on media sports uh, rights as a retail company, as a web services company? Yeah, I mean, I, I couldn't, uh, I don't know exactly what strategy, um, you know, they're, they're thinking about, but I mean, they, you know, they want to be a winner. And, you know, the uh, NBA is, uh, you know, booming over the last decade and, and continue to see anything stopping in the near future. And I think um, Amazon wants, wants to, 
you know, get in front of that audience. It's a progressive uh, league. It's mm -hmm. growing fast. It's got a younger audience. And, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it continues to grow, and obviously you knew that. The WNBA also is growing exponentially, too. I, I, I would assume their next media contract is going to be a lot bigger than the past one that they had. Absolutely. Uh, and talk a little bit about that, because that kind of surprised me. I remember early on uh, just seeing some of my family members who were huge like into WNBA. This is you know, several years ago, and I just didn't quite get it. And now it's, I feel like everyone's into it now. Yeah, and then with Caitlin yeah. Clark yeah. You know, joining the league, too, yeah. you just see another uh, step change yeah. in, in enthusiasm for the league. But, yeah, it's... it's uh, I think the next 10 years, we're going to see it continue to, to grow at a, an incredible rate. So it's very exciting to see, especially as a dad of two daughters. And I just I, I love to see that. When you look at sports overall, and more, and more importantly, the folks watching sports, yeah. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion, particularly when it comes to media rights, that uh, everything's so fragmented, right? I mean, like, you know, the NBA is spread out now amongst, uh, what, four different networks or four different umbrella networks. Uh, the NFL is going in the same direction, MLB as well here. Do you think that's a model in terms of being able to capture eyeballs that's better than just having everything, like when we were kids, where everything was just on either NBC or ABC or CBS. Yeah, I mean, definitely more, yeah. more more distribution, more eyeballs, mm -hmm. more access. So yeah, I mean, I'm definitely not the right person to ask on this. I am so focused on my uh, startup right now, okay. Wonder, and and so yeah. I'm I'm sort of not plugged into. <laughs> I no, I, I hear you. I hear you. But as an NBA team owner, um, I'm curious whether you think expansion of the league is something that's going to happen in the next two years or next five years, given that the media rights deal has now been finalized. And everyone was looking at that as the next leg, right? Yep. There have definitely been a lot of discussions about it. Yeah. But again, I'm, I'm not in the loop on that. So. All right. All right. Not the right person. Well, well, Mark Laurie is sticking with us because we are going to discuss his newest startup as part of our next up segment. In the meantime, let's take a look at how markets close on the day, Romain. Um, you had a wacky week. I mean, yes, the S&P 500 closed up on the day yeah. uh, after two days of losses and after some pretty steep losses as well. But part of the big story here is this rotation and how yeah. the rotation out of tech and into smaller companies is intact. And a lot of it has to do with that last line on your screen here, the moves that we saw in yields on a mm -hmm. weekly basis basis and more importantly the anticipation that those yields are going to continue to go down a lot of the bets right now looking at a 10-year below four before we get to the end of the year two to three rate cuts and a big fed meeting next wednesday where you know jay powell is going to be asked about this yeah not just the fed there's also the boe and the boj as well this is the close on bloomberg It's time for our next up segment where we highlight the entrepreneurs and the founders moving the needle for our economy, for markets, and for technology. And Wonder is the latest brainchild of Mark Laurie. It offers fast, fine dining with quick and convenient delivery in 35 minutes or less. And if you're in New York City, New Jersey, or Pennsylvania, you can stop by a Wonder storefront for a made-to-order dining experience. Mark joins us now. He is chairman, founder, and CEO of Wonder Group. And of course, he's still with us. Mark, um, you had originally envisioned this as a food truck business, and then you pivoted to brick and mortar. Talk us through your thinking there and whether it was a risky move in your perspective. Yeah, I mean, now it's we're 18 months out from that last mm -hmm. uh, pivot away. I think, you know, the brick and mortar allows us to put all 30 restaurants that we had into one location so you can order multiple restaurants in a single delivery. And I think that is one of the big value props. We also set a really tight delivery radius so we can deliver sub 30 minutes order to eat. The actual delivery time is not more than six minutes in the city. So the food's coming to you hot on time. We're vertically integrated. We own the delivery. We own the cooking. We own the restaurants and the mm -hmm. tech. So we're able to time the delivery with the cooking mm -hmm. so that the food doesn't sit in the kitchen. So there's big advantages to being vertically integrated. But we've got 30 different cuisines, 30 different restaurants that we own that are all available on the Wonder app, available for pickup or delivery from the same location. So take a step back here and just walk us through what the problem you were looking to solve is here. I mean, how did you look at this as here's the problem and here's the solution? Yeah, so I mean, if you're looking fast casual has been growing a lot faster than fast food. Uh, people want higher quality food. And then, you know, food delivery has been exploding over the last 10 years and expected to continue. If you look at the, the delivery experience, it's not always ideal. So uh, higher prices, uh, long delivery times, the quality of food suffers, it's not always hot. Yeah. So the idea of being vertically integrated, you get sort of the best of fast casual 
with the best of delivery and all, all well, talk about the delivery component of that this, this actually hits home because yeah. my wife hates ordering now because she thinks you know she doesn't like the delivery side of it she okay. thinks it's uh whatever i won't go into that don't <laughs> go into it here but how do you manage that here so is the idea that you have more control over that process, meaning of once it leaves the door and gets to uh, my doorstep, you have more oversight and control over that than maybe, say, a DoorDash or Seamless or whatever. Yeah, we have more control yeah. because we set a really tight delivery radius yeah. of not more than six minutes in the city. Right. So we won't deliver more than six minutes. We won't batch orders. Yeah. But since we control all the cooking, mm -hmm. we're able to time the cooking with the courier. We built all our own tech. Mm -hmm. So we can, if you order from five different restaurants, we can sequence the cooking so it all finishes at the same time. Right. And it immediately gets picked up by a courier and then delivered. Right. So it's faster. It's going to be more on time. Mm -hmm. It's going to be... Um, more accurate as well. Can so I ask you about the pricing on it and, and yeah. whether that pricing is competitive to if I had just gone to a restaurant and, and, and tried to buy takeout or even eat in myself? Yeah, it's going to be a lot cheaper, mm -hmm. again, because we're vertically integrated. So we can get a Bobby Filet, Filet Mignon steak cooked to perfection, mm -hmm. 10 ounce filet for yeah. $32. Yeah. Um, if you're going to go to the restaurant and get the same steak, it'd be 55 let's yeah, say. Yeah. So yeah, the prices are, are very, very good. There's also a hardware component to this as well, because you're looking at what you could do to perhaps um, insert Wonder and this, this model into stadiums, into convention centers, into airport lounges. How would that work? Yeah, so we built the technology. It's been six years and hundreds of millions of dollars invested to be able to cook all 30 restaurants on one technology platform. So it looks less like a kitchen and more like a micro fulfillment center from that sense. So two pieces of electric cooking equipment can cook over 600 different meals across 30 restaurants and nothing's frozen and nothing's reheated. It's all cooked. Mm -hmm. So it really is cutting edge technology, culinary engineering, and food science. We take that technology and we give it to stadiums, arenas, mm -hmm. hospitals, hotels, cruise ships, yeah. and then we send them food mm -hmm. so they can replicate the same quality, but it's all white label. We don't use the Wonder brand or any of our restaurant brands. How many locations do you have right now? There's 14 locations open right now in the New York metro area, but we're opening one new location a week. So we opened one last week, one this week, next week's Williamsburg, and wow. it's going to keep adding Impressive. one a week uh, through the end of next year. So 78 locations in the next 78 weeks. 78 and 70 weeks. Yep. So you're going to be a busy man. I yeah, assume. we're busy. Yeah, we're no busy. vacations yeah. for you coming we're busy. up anytime soon. <laughs> we're busy. Uh, Mark, really appreciate you taking uh, time you. for us. Uh, thanks for bearing with our questions. Mark Laurie is the chairman, founder, and CEO of the startup Wonder Group. Stick with us. We're going to set you up for what could be another momentous week up ahead. This is Bloomberg. All right, more than 170 large cap companies scheduled to report earnings next week. McDonald's among them. They report on Monday before the bell and investors looking for any color around the fast food chain's $5 meal deal. Sarah Henry, she's joining us right now, managing director and portfolio manager over at Logan Capital Management. All right, let's get right to it, Sarah. I mean, a lot of people are looking at economic conditions, they're looking at consumer spending, and they want to know whether those consumer dollars are still flowing into McDonald's. Are they? They have been, um, and they've been walking away from McDonald's on the lower end uh, cohorts who have said, you've taken so much pricing that it is no longer a good value for me to come into McDonald's. So uh, they have introduced at the last six days of the quarter this $5 value meal. And the early data, the early mobile data is showing that there are people coming back into these stores. And that's going to be critical for them. Mm -hmm. to recapture the narrative on value and um, grow the whole business. Yeah, we saw some of that data over by uh, Placer AI, Bloomberg reporting here that we did see a big bump in traffic starting in late May. And it raises the question, Sarah, about this idea of McDonald's leaning back into value. Because I think for some of us, we always think of McDonald's and some of its competitors as being value propositions. But I'm sure you saw all the anecdotal evidence of people going into their McDonald's and posting, you know, screenshots of their receipts showing, you know, that for a burger, fries and, you know, a drink, uh, they were paying way more than what they used to pay in the past. Absolutely. And I think that for McDonald's, you know, there's certain qualities about this business that are scarce and value added. And it's not always the food that it sells. It's the narrative around convenience and the drive through. They do 70 percent of the business through the drive through and they have a really robust technology driven market level customer data 
that they can, um, you know, glean from uh, different types of data to get consumers in the door. And, um, you know, I think the idea that they can um, offer things on the high end, which are more innovative to consumers that are willing to pay for it, like the famous orders and the grimace meal that they had last year, that's quite a difficult comparison for them. And then on the lower end, kind of barbell it with a $5 deal that's going to make people feel confident there. They're getting what, what they would like to pay for. Yeah. Um, it would be a powerful narrative in um, changing, lifting uh, the whole business. What about the um, offerings, the product offerings, the food offerings, menu changes? Uh, is McDonald's in a position right now to experiment with that, or do they have to kind of uh, make sure that they've got their bases covered in terms of making sure they offer value? Um, it's a good question. I think McDonald's has a very sort of homogenous on one hand, but robust on the other hand um, offering because they have so much international uh, exposure that they can learn from. So they, they're very famously, if you look on TikTok, people go around to different McDonald's in um, different countries and, and uh, try out what they are offering there. And they're going to be bringing some of those things into the U.S. So we are hearing about a, um, a chicken Big Mac that should be coming. Mm. They have a better burger platform, which is a more flavorful and a bigger burger. Um, and, and over time, they've tried to iterate it to be more of a higher quality offering, too, which has allowed it to take pricing over this period. Sarah, how important to you is an increased dividend? Is this something that McDonald's is going to be more aggressive on, you think? Yes. So they have uh, McDonald's is almost, I would say, sometimes we call it a mixed staples company when we talk about it because it is such a reliable um, d driver of stable growth and dividends. And the reason for that is they generate the majority of their income through royalties, not explicitly through food sales. So um, it makes it a very stable growth asset. They've raised the dividend for 49 years. This is something we care a lot about um, on our team. And it's a, it, it's yeah. a sign that they've managed to per, uh, persist year in and year out through different business cycles. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, yes. <laughs> All right, Sarah, going to have to leave it there. Sarah Henry over at Logan Capital. A uh, nice preview here of McDonald's. Those earnings come out on Monday. A few other things that investors will have their eyes on that could move the market. And it starts on Tuesday with the beginning of that two-day FOMC meeting. Yeah, a two-day FOMC meeting. We don't get the decision till Wednesday, but we do have earnings in the meantime to keep us occupied. Uh, we're going to be breaking it down the numbers from Starbucks, from AMD, and from Microsoft. So what we were talking about with regards to pricing and value uh, may or yeah. may not apply to Starbucks here too. Wednesday, the Fed decision that comes midday along with the press conference and after the bell, we do get some big earnings here that really could reshape the tone in the market, depending on what they say, Scarlett. Yeah, well, Meta is a big one because um, it's actually been integrating AI into uh, its advertising. So this is a real test to see if these MAG7 companies are really going to show meaningful uh, progress in terms of incorporating AI into their bottom line. Qualcomm, Boeing also reporting on Wednesday. On Thursday, we get more earnings out of the tech cohorts. And these are the ones that I think really could move the market. Apple, Amazon, Intel, who you got? Uh, I'm looking at Apple and China yeah. and how it does yeah. in China. That's a big one. Yeah, I'm interested in Amazon. And actually, Intel has actually kind of been kind of a stealth and been under a stealth rally for a little US bit. U.S. chip maker, yeah, right? Yeah, we get like a BOE like decision as well next week. And on Friday, that big U.S. payrolls report coming along with some earnings out of Chevron and Exxon. Full market coverage right here on the close all week long with Scarlett and myself. If you want your politics coverage, that's coming up next right here on Bloomberg.